This is The Leap. I'm Judy Campbell. And just a quick warning, there's explicit language in this episode. Way before Bray Spelden decided to jump on a plane to Iraq and sneak across the Syrian border to join a leftist Kurdish militia, he was a kid working in San Francisco flower shops. Even then, he was a provocateur. But he'd be the first to admit that it used to be kind of silly. Getting in fights, getting drunk, making people mad, flicking people's hats off on the bus and stuff. Like the, the punk from that Star Trek movie where they go back in time, like the 80s. It's this classic scene. A scowling punk with an orange mohawk and dog collar is blasting his boombox on the bus. And Spock puts him out with a Vulcan nerve punch. I was like that guy. Brace's childhood was pretty rough. His mother committed suicide when he was six. He cycled through five high schools. By the time he was 18, he had a terrible addiction to heroin and meth. He got sober in his 20s. I've had a lot of sudden sort of uh, canyons in my life, most of which caused by me, not all of them. And yeah, I've, I've somehow been able to retain the same personality through all of it. And that personality, it has a lot of sides. He's always been funny. And there's the outrageous, irreverent bit, the troublemaker, whose punk band war crime pretended to be enthusiastically pro-war. But at the same time, he's always read like crazy, swallowed books, and researched everything he was interested in, which was a lot. He'd eventually work his way through reams of political texts and identify as a communist. But early on, Brace was swept up by the romance of the Spanish Civil War, sparked when he read For Whom the Bell Tolls, Hemingway, writing about an American joining the war to fight fascism in the 1930s. From when I was like a teenager, reading about the international brigades in Spain and really just thinking of like idolizing these people, like that's like the, really this the selfless, especially people who died. From all over the world, 40,000 volunteers organized by the Communist International came to fight for the Spanish Republic. This film clip celebrates the sacrifice of volunteers who came to defend Spain against Franco and the fascists who were trying to take over. Among them, more than 3,000 Americans, the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. A civilian army of liberals, socialists, and idealists who years later would all be branded as communists. His girlfriend, Jen Snyder, remembers one of their first dates when he talked and talked about the Lincoln Brigade. One of the reasons that I realized I wanted to be with him was because the way he talked about it with like such deep compassion and and love was so incredible he we were you know walking around we used to just walk around the city all the time and he was telling me about how these men would go over to Spain just to fight fascism and going over for this purpose greater than themselves and most of them would not come back the fascists won but the anti-fascists had given the world an example of heroic resistance. And just how beautiful that is to just lay everything down for your principles. And it's just something he had never gotten to do. Like, I can't even imagine what a lonely communist existence he must have led. Brace says it was kind of a lonely communist existence then. He felt purposeless. He didn't know what to do with his big ideas. I don't want to say that I had no outlet because I did do political work, but it wasn't. Back then, it was sort of bleak. Obama was president. There wasn't a lot of fire behind domestic revolutionary causes. But then Brace began reading about something happening in northern Syria. A radical political experiment in a region called Rojava. You may not know about it. A lot of people don't. It started in 2012 in the chaos of the Syrian civil war. Kurdish people fighting for a homeland had begun living under their own unique bottom-up system of governance founded on ideals of gender equality, freedom of religion, and environmentalism. It was inspired by an imprisoned Kurdish revolutionary leader and also by the writings of an obscure Vermont socialist and political theorist. Some hailed it as the Rojava Revolution, reawakening the dashed utopian hopes of the Arab Spring. Leftists worldwide were entranced. For Brace, it was so exciting. Not communist, but maybe close enough. It was interesting because what they're doing hasn't been tried before, and that's also what appealed to me. I was like, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe it'll work. 
He wanted to see it and kept talking to Jen about it. I loved what he was saying. And I I think I was imagining this like, I don't even know, like humanitarian work. You know, he kept talking about like, oh, there's doctors there. And I was like, what if you're just definitely not a doctor and you actually don't have any like do they, they don't need like someone to write copy for them or whatever, do they? If so, Brace couldn't figure it out. He couldn't find a humanitarian group looking for volunteers. But Rojava's militia was seeking recruits. It's called the YPG, and it's made up of men and women fighters defending Rojava. Rojava is surrounded by enemies. There's Turkey, which wants to quash an independent Kurdish movement, and ISIS, which was expanding its hold over the region. Brace had been following the militia in the news. They were really, like, extraordinary, especially the rescue of the Yazidis. This was about four years ago, and it didn't happen in Syria. It was in Iraq, where ISIS had taken over the town of Sinjar, killing thousands of Yazidis, an ethnic minority, and driving masses of refugees into the mountains to hide, violently pursued by ISIS. And the YPG and other Kurdish forces had come to protect them. Nearly 20,000 stranded Yazidi Iraqis were rescued from Mount Sinjar and taken to safety just over the Syrian-Iraqi border. Thousands got- and the Kurdish forces escorted them to safety. They had to break through this pretty thick line of ISIS to get there. I just thought it was really, like, it took a lot of, of, of guts and it was really brave and nice of them to do. Nice. The way Bray sees it, this wasn't a land grab, a territorial move. These were people devoted to their principles, gender equity, religious freedom, that ISIS was the opposite of. They made a stand to protect the Yazidi from ISIS. Turns out there was a website for YPG International to help foreign volunteers join the militia. Brace reached out just to see what it was about. I just did it sort of like, well, I'll send them an email and see if they respond. And then three months later, they responded, and it sort of snowballed from there. The YPG asked volunteers to serve a six-month tour. Brace was sent a questionnaire. He says it seemed designed to weed people out who wanted to go because they were itching to fight in a war. And at that point, the, the YPG International was under new management. There was a new commander, and they were trying to get more explicitly political people. Brace was that, but he wasn't a military guy or a fitness guy. I gotta run, you know? I hate running. What makes people put their lives on the line for a belief or an idea, something that doesn't affect them directly? When we think of people making decisions like this, we usually think of zealots, religious or political, people putting on blinders, narrowing their focus. But Brace isn't really that. He was intrigued by Rojava, excited by it, but skeptical, too, of the glowing reports coming from the left. But he was so curious. What kind of revolution is this? He wanted to see it. Joining YPG was the only way I could get there, the only way I could figure out to get there. But was it his battle to fight? Brace felt if he was going to have these Marxist-Leninist beliefs, at some point, he needed to act on them. That was really became the overriding thing. I was like, I feel like it's my duty. Of course, there's also a romance, an adventure to that, too, to the march of these comrades finding solidarity and purpose in war. He was thinking of those heroes of his in the Spanish Civil War, people who put their lives on the line to support their fellow revolutionaries. It represents this sort of like what a socialist we should be striving for, which is, which is internationalism, like assisting you know, our fellow workers in other places and, and of course, at home. In this fight, it looks similar to Spain in a lot of ways. A band of revolutionaries fighting against the ultimate conservative fascist-like force, ISIS. It was his chance to put his beliefs in action. The YPG emailed him a date to arrive, and Brace bought a plane ticket. But one of the problems of not having blinders on, it makes it harder to believe in your decision. I felt like it was just a dumb decision from the entire time, from like when I made the decision until now. No one could call it a smart decision, no matter how, how rosy your, your glasses are. So how does one prep for joining a foreign militia? Brace didn't know, so he bought a cheap backpack, borrowed some thermal underwear, and grappled with what he had decided to do. And I kept like sort of playing through the future and thinking like, okay, if I die, just like imagine what my uh, feelings my partner would would be having or what she would go through and you know how what her days would be like after that and uh, how it would like really ruin her life and ruin a couple other people's not that I'm so great that it would ruin a lot of people's lives but you know my family would ruin at least a year Um, 
and uh, and feeling just tremendously guilty about that. But I still had, I had to go through it. Because he had made the decision. But he was lying about it. He didn't tell Jen and his family that he was joining militia. He made up a story about going there to help with the radio station. He says he didn't want them to talk him out of it, and he didn't want them to worry. His last days before he left were hard, saying his goodbyes. It was like I was walking through, like, molasses or something. It was, I was, it was moving really slowly. Everything looked too bright. I mean, I felt like I wouldn't see any of, any of it again. Um, I didn't think, I, you know, I didn't have one of those, like, premonitions that I was going to die or anything, but I was like, there's an extremely real and semi-high chance that this is it. Yeah, and just really sad. I think probably the, it's the saddest I've ever been in my life. I felt like I was making a terrible mistake. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. October of 2016, Brace was 27 years old. He flew to Iraq. Someone there would arrange for him to cross the border into Syria. And on the plane, his mood started to lift. I definitely felt a lot better. and I was, it, was, it was like, all right, I'm locked into this. Whatever is going to happen is going to happen. And at that point, I, I, I did feel like a little happy and ex- certainly excited. The only information he had was a number to call when he got to the airport. After several calls, someone finally answered and directed him to a safe house where things were surreal. The uh, assistant safe house manager forced us to watch a TED talk, which I zoned out of completely and pretended like it wasn't happening. Something about Islam. But Your introduction was a TED talk on Islam. Yeah, and this guy wasn't Muslim either. He was just like, he just thought it was like had a good message or something. It was like, you know, one of those inspiring ones. There were a couple of other Americans there, too, on their way to Syria, and some wounded Kurdish fighters taken there for treatment, a living preview of where they were headed. We met a guy who had been wounded during the siege of Kobani, and he, had, uh, he was staying at the safe house. Uh, he had, like, six bullet holes, like, right across him. Like, someone had slashed him with a machine gun, I guess. Uh, and I think he might have been missing a leg. I can't remember. I met a lot of people missing legs or limbs at that, that point. From there, he went to a mountain camp. Brace got his code name there, Rashid. At nightfall, they set out on a hike. Which is where he made me first big mistake, which is I, I did not think to bring extra water. So I was unclear about how long exactly the, the walk would be. They clandestinely crossed over from Iraq to Syria, across the Tigris River. On the other side, they were told to walk and watch for landmines. We had one pair of night vision sort of binoculars with only one with lens working. Bray says it was about 20 kilometers and it took about 10 hours. You go very slowly, and you a lot of the time you're kind of like down on your kind of haunches walking, like duck walking, basically. And then all of a sudden we get to like a road and have to sprint across it. At that point, we had no water. I didn't know we couldn't smoke either. And I was like, wow, these, these Kurdish guys are really tough. Like they don't have, they're not drinking water either. And then later I, I realized once I got to know some of the YPG people better, I was like, wait a minute, they just forgot to bring water too. Eventually, Brace ends up at an academy with about 40 other foreign fighters, where he'll stay for a month. He'll train there, try to learn the language, take political classes. He's there with more Americans and Europeans. And if he hadn't thought much about his own death yet, he had to, because they made martyr videos. So if they were killed, this is what would be sent to his family and to his girlfriend, Jen. They're very sad to do, and you kind of want to rush through them. Mine was always just like, I love you guys, sorry I died. It was a little better than that, but it, was, it wasn't it was super long. I got better at them as they went on. It's very difficult to express, because there's also like eight people watching you. Literally, there's like your all your classmates are like standing around, like kind of goofing off while you're doing it. Ray says he didn't get a lot of military training, and the equipment was shoddy. He was put in the heavy weapons unit, and after about a month at the academy, it was off to the front. At this point, the YPG was launching an offensive toward the ISIS stronghold of Raqqa. Brace's unit, about 20 of them, there were a couple other foreigners, but mostly Kurds, was sent right in to drive ISIS out of a town. So Brace, who volunteered for this fight because he wanted to see a socialist experiment, was going in, knowing very little about how to fight in war, to fight ISIS a force made up of thousands of dedicated foreign volunteers, many likely more eager than Brace to give up their lives for their cause. It sounds terrifying, but Brace sounds almost nonchalant about the battle he entered. It's not like battle where you're like, you know, going up against the Germans at D-Day or whatever. It's like, 
I think there's like a few guys in that house over there. That's like 500 meters away. We shouldn't go in that house. We should wait until they leave and then shoot it up. So uh, nobody was shooting back? No, they were shooting back and they were mortaring us and stuff like pretty heavily a couple of days. Um, but like, I mean, it just, I don't know. It, was, it wasn't that intense, you know? Like they would mortar us, but then they would shoot like just like 10 mortars at a time. The Kurdish militia was winning. ISIS was on the retreat, driven out of towns and territory they'd occupied. Dramatic, in theory, but it could be slow, this fighting across long distances, and eerie. Brace doesn't know if he killed anyone, because so many of them were firing shots at the ISIS fighters. There was a nerve-wracking boredom, long days, weeks of alertness, hidden landmines laying in wait. Brace had several terrifying close calls. Once he stepped on a landmine, but it didn't go off. And there were ISIS suicide bombers, though they could be more strange than scary. They sounded a lot, like four or five a day at the first like week of the operation, which was totally stupid because it was just an open desert and you could just like drive away from them if you needed to. Fighting ISIS is not what brought Brace to this battle. It was supporting the Kurds and this grand political experiment beating back their enemies. Still, it was a good feeling releasing people from ISIS hold, being there, fighting often under female command, and defending a society that mandated gender equity in leadership positions while releasing women from radical Islam. After they had taken the town of Tal Simon, refugees streamed out. There was a very small river uh, sort of intersecting our lines and enemy lines. And one day they just, oh, this queue of refugees sort of just lined up and started coming across. Sometimes very touching and very beautiful. We saw a husband and a wife like sort of run across uh, holding hands. And uh, I saw these women sort of tear off their veils and throw them in the, into the water. Uh, and was, you know, they were doing that la, 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 thing that, um, that people out there can do, which I cannot imitate. Um, that was really cool. Meanwhile, back in San Francisco, Brace's girlfriend, Jen, was worried about intensified fighting in Syria, worried that Brace, who, remember, had lied to her and said he was working in a radio station, might be in danger. She scoured the Internet for news of what was going on there, and she found a Russian TV clip and saw Brace, her boyfriend. He looks like the, the intellectual, lactose intolerant, sweet guy that he is, you know. But there he was. Like coming out of a tank with this other little Jewish kid with glasses, too. And Brace was, like, talking about how he was, like, a soldier, and he was, like, wearing a soldier's uniform, and he was walking out of a tank. It took her a minute to realize what she was seeing, and when she did, she was so upset. She and Brace had been writing emails and could sometimes talk by phone. She demanded answers, and Brace said yes. He was fighting in a militia, and he hadn't told her because he didn't want to stress her out. Because when he left, she had been working 14 hours a day running a campaign for a far-left city supervisor. But now, she was very stressed out. Waiting for someone who might be dying any day is the worst experience. And I was really resentful about it for a really long time because it's not cool. She was so worried about Brace. I called the YPG at one point. <laughs> I called I called them and I got through and they were going to go look for him. And then I heard from him. But it, I hadn't heard from him for like four days. You know, I don't even know how I got the guy's number. But she also understood what he was doing. It made sense that Bryce was out there fighting for this cause. He was doing it because he like really cares. He wanted to like make the world better. He wanted to like stop evil, you know, and replace it with, like, something very beautiful. And then it got even weirder, because something happened that neither of them expected. It had everything to do with Brace, who he was, but he wasn't in control of it or what it would become. Brace had become a celebrity. He was, like, everybody's favorite communist suddenly. Brace had been tweeting from Syria. A few examples. He posted a picture of himself in the rusty cabin of his patched-together battle wagon and tweeted, Wow, this freaking taxi stinks. And, sorry I haven't tweeted, I've been, lowers shattered sunglasses, revealing empty, bleeding eye sockets, killing ISIS guys. And this, war changes you. Two weeks ago I was an idealist, now all I desire is Wi-Fi good enough for 30 seconds of bang bus. Yes, Bang Bus is reality TV porno. Brace wasn't the only person dispatching from the front, but he was the only one doing it like this. 
Some people would try to like do it like very seriously and be like diaries. I'm like a war guy, but I just, what am I going to do? Like I got diarrhea behind a donkey. And feels the need to tweet about it. Among a certain segment of the left, this killed. Brace's type of jokey, no-holds-barred internet presence shifting between masturbation, leftist political analysis, diarrhea, skewering insults, was having its moment with the far left. It had amped up around the Bernie Sanders campaign, a movement self-named the dirtbag left, a spit in the eye to careful liberal centrism. And now, someone was doing this from Syria? I was just like, I don't know, I'm here now, but I still have like the same sense of humor, so... I was like, I should be kind of more normal so I don't get in trouble if, like, YPG sees it, but I'm unable and, like, incapable of doing that. But he says for the most part, the YPG was fine with it. They liked the attention it was bringing to the cause. Brace had more than 30,000 people following his tweets. Rolling Stone wrote up a big spread on Americans fighting with the YPG, featuring him. Other media followed. I mean, obviously, I'm not fucking Rambo, and like, I'm not, you know, I, I do not think that I, uh, my presence was a military benefit to the Kurds. Um, but I, I think that like, the one thing I did was, you know, making jo- jokes on the internet, basically, as stupid as that sounds. I think, in some small way, helped. With the wider celebrity came critics. Was he making light of the devastating civil war, using this for his own personal adventure? Was he a privileged dilettante who could dip in and out at his whim? Was it even his war to fight? And then word got to Brace that a movie had been optioned from the Rolling Stone article featuring him, and Jake Gyllenhaal had signed on. It felt like a mockery of everything he had come to Syria for. The Hollywood Reporter described it as a movie about a search for identity, the story of a ragtag team of American volunteers, socialists, and outcasts fighting, with Kurds, to beat ISIS and establish an anarchist collective amid the rubble of war. To Brace, this isn't just corny and inaccurate, but also destructive and anti-revolutionary. He came to Syria to support a social revolution. He ended up spoon-feeding Hollywood an imperialist buddy movie. I will do everything in my power to stop it. And my powers are, they may not be vast, but they can be very unconventional. Brace's enormous provocative personality had put the media spotlight on him. But Brace felt his individual self actually receding, being there, living with the militia. His ego, his wants and needs were becoming less important. They took a back seat, and he was happy about that. I couldn't have really known this going in, but yeah, I felt... Uh, a whole, a part of something. It sort of um, suppressed this individualism that I have, which of course still found a way to, to come out like with me like making jokes on the internet and stuff. And sort of gave me a taste at what like post-capitalist social relations might be. Because he was living with people who shared everything and didn't own things. And because through so many meetings and self-criticism sessions, sometimes with people who'd been fighting as communists for decades, they were learning to work together. Everything was... I guess discussed and discussed and discussed and discussed and discussed, and we still got things done. Um, And it was people from very different sort of political backgrounds, all from the left, but from very different, I guess, sort of tendencies within the socialist movement. Brace had wanted to put theory to action when coming to Syria. It was one of the things that drove him there. The action that he craved wasn't on the battlefield. It was the nitty-gritty of political work, of trying to live in a social movement. Brace was on the front almost the entire time he was there. So the civilian society of Rojava, the way it functioned, what he had so desperately wanted to see, he barely got to see it. He only got to visit for a couple of days, and he pestered people with questions. That was really something to see. Like I saw this like, office where all these women were just positively yelling into these, these, these phones at people, like trying to coordinate the communes. And the fact that these people were like dedicated to communalizing things. Like There was a, people working 24 hours a day, basically, to, uh, to make sure the communes worked, to open new communes, to train people um, to be able to work together in these sort of collectives. He was impressed by the dedication in the face of few resources. And he saw that in the military, too. Not everyone, but with many. More committed people than I'd ever seen anywhere else in my life. And in this way, Brace found his own role. He noticed his class clown tendencies were helping bring people together, calm tensions in his unit. The diarrhea stuff went over great. And there's this kind of humor that he never would have thought would fly in a war zone, a Syrian war zone. And here it was, working. You'd think that like people who's like seen the destruction that ISIS has wrought wouldn't find it funny if you're like, 
hymenisis. No, people love that joke. It's, a, it's not really a joke, but people th- think it's very funny to say. If you just say, I'm an ISIS? Yeah, or like, that guy's an ISIS. Like, check it out. That guy, because like, I, I did that at first, and like, people were like, no, people are going to get so mad at you. I'm like, no, check it out. They'll think it's funny. And uh, they did. But then that kept happening. Like, other people would be like, hey, check it out. That guy's an ISIS. Like, they'd introduce their buddy and be like, yeah, it's my friend, like, you know, Ahmed. He's an ISIS. You guys are like stepping over ISIS landmines yeah. making these jokes. Well, it's, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, what are you going to do? Brace eventually learned the Kurdish language, mostly by struggling to land jokes. And that experience he'd been yearning for back in the States, he got it. Because I felt part of something, like and we were all moving communally towards a, a sort of singular purpose. Uh, obviously, that is a gross exaggeration of, of, I don't mean all, but most of the people I was immediately with. It was fulfilling. But he's sheepish talking about this, what he learned from the experience. It's awful close to the Hollywood Jake Gyllenhaal version of himself. War is not a personal retreat to find a more fulfilled life. Now, I'm not turning to this eat, pray, love for, you know, G.I. Joe, eat, pray, love shit. When Brace's six months were up, he had mixed feelings about leaving. It was basically a 50-50 mixture of like really wanting to see and stay and like really wanting to get the fuck out of there. He was excited to get back to Jen, who had continued to go through a very weird and anxious time while her famous communist boyfriend was off fighting. She had read in the Washington Post that Brace was planning on asking her to marry him when he came back. Brace expected he'd be asked a lot of questions at the airport, but he sailed through. Joining the YPG is not illegal in the U.S. Jen was at the airport waiting for him. And I spotted her and uh, used my newfound sneaking skills to, like, go behind her and sneak up. Woo! You know... And then I turned around, it was like some guy in this giant, weird scarf, you know, and he's just like this furry, dirty scarf guy. And I'm like, uh, it's like when your dad shaves this mustache and you're like, who the fuck are you? It all took some getting used to for them both. Well, it was like a great, great first day back. It's a little jarring later that it kicked in. Like it was, I was kind of like fish out of water uh, for a little while, actually had some little panicky moments a couple times just like so strange being back and like being around a lot of people and like I think just kind of depression and like not knowing what I was doing next. Brace had lost friends in the battle when he was there and after he returned home as the YPG closed in on Raqqa and fighting intensified more people died. My commander died like half my old fire team died Uh, my good friend Chia died I literally like like 30 or 40 people at least my best friend amongst them was this guy Jack Holmes. Um, He's a British guy. He was trying to process those deaths and readjust to his life and deal with being a sort of celebrity. People were recognizing him, wanting to talk to him about his snarky Twitter feed. But it didn't feel right. He was tired of his odd pocket of fame. He felt funny about it. Yeah, I was just sick of talking about it. You know, I I also felt weird because a lot of focus was on me as a person, like me personally. And that felt weird and wrong. Twitter shut down Brace's account for insulting people. But Brace says it was time. It needed to end. That sort of tempts a bad part of my personality. Like a bullying part and like a, like a sort of like, a, it's kind of narcissistic part. Like, I like being funny. I like telling jokes. But I don't need, you know, I don't need to do it to like all these people. After his return, Brace had a real urge to go back, to fight again, rejoin the movement. But that subsided over time. He says he wants to go back to Rojava someday. I definitely support the Kurdish freedom movement 100%. But, I mean, I don't know if I'm the best spokesman for it. They have a lot more eloquent and, and respectable people. He had returned to a country different than he left, with Trump as president. And that's meant a more active and mobilized leftist movement than when he went to Syria. And they have a lot of work to do. It's selfish of me to go back there, you know? It's good of me to be here. Like, this is where I have to do, like, this is my home. I should, like, fix things here. Not fix things, to destroy things and build new ones. So Brace is politically involved. He's working on tenants' rights and other issues. It doesn't give him the satisfaction or engage him the way being in Syria did. But he says, that doesn't matter. But I have to do political work because I have to do that. I don't know. You got to do that. If you believe in something, you have to do it. He's said this sort of thing before. It's that kind of thinking that took him to Syria. But right now, it means something quieter. It means staying at home, politically active, locally, with Jen, 
who, by the way, Brace did propose to. He did it privately, not in a newspaper, but on a beautiful hike in a redwood forest outside of San Francisco, where he grew up and where he says he wants to be. That's The Leap.